More immediately, Channel 4 found itself at the heart of another controversy for doing what it had always done. You should stop me. I think that one of the Channel 4's key values, even to this day, is the idea that it's engaged in reflecting change as it happens, anticipating change, being at the forefront of change, seeing things before they're mainstream. And probably the area where that's at its most obvious is in sexual politics. Uh, you see within the way in which we treated lesbianism and homosexuality that Channel 4 was light years ahead uh, of other broadcasters. I think the best example of that was Queer as Folk. Uh, that sort of summed up where we wanted to take the channel in the sense that it was a program that was... It, 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 it wasn't banging a drum for a particular gay view of the world. Thought your breakfast was 20 it wasn't us, straight people, looking at them, gay people. To me, that program sums up a kind of a questioning, thoughtful view of the world. It's all bed sheets. I'd forgotten how much teenage boys masturbate. Mom. And Channel 4, I think, has been a part of a change to a more diverse, more multicultural, uh, less emotionally frigid kind of Britain. But though Queer as Folk still ran into the usual flack from some of the press, that was nothing to what happened next. By taking on the tabloid's bogeyman, Channel 4 showed it was still prepared to risk making enemies of Middle England. These men are members of a paedophile gang who tortured and killed a young boy. Most will soon be out of prison. That programme was itself a very Channel 4 programme. The popular genre in TV was getting people out of prison. So it was actually a very daring programme because it resulted in a dreadful paedophile going to prison. During wider inquiries into paedophile crimes, Leslie Bailey was picked up on the Kingsmead by police. Dispatches has uncovered a history of Bailey's sexual abuse. The Dispatches programme was certainly disturbing, but what caused the row was a parody of it, also aired on Channel 4. In 1986, Jez North was convicted for multiple acts. We believe his story is actually too upsetting to transmit. We only do so tonight with that proviso. These are our children. They skip down our streets, but the paedophile is waiting. The big uh, furore of Michael Grade's time was Brass Eye, and uh, not surprisingly, perhaps, it was also the biggest furore of my time at the channel. Why can we no longer think of the British Isles without the word pedoph in front of them? Yeah, yeah. Ah! This really got up people's noses. It touched a, a, a hot button because it dared to take something which people feel very, very angry and upset about, helped, of course, as ever, by the Daily Mail. And I have the, uh, the headline from the time, uh, the sickest TV show ever. The documentary was a spoof, but the public outcry seemed real enough. I watched it as any other viewer and was shocked, as thousands of people have been shocked by what I saw. Tessa Jowell, who was the culture minister at the time, she phoned to voice her concern. And uh, she didn't seem to know that it was a spoof. She really did seem to believe that it was an actual current affairs programme. I think you can parody any subject. My objection to Brass Eye was just that I think that Chris Morris was wrong. I think it's really easy for middle-class people to say the dangers of paedophilia are exaggerated. There are parks that I could show Chris Morris that are absolutely full of paedophiles, but they're not parks in nicey-nicey middle-class areas. Good evening. Welcome to Pedergeddon. Like the broadcasting this. regulator wrapped Channel 4's knuckles for not providing enough warning to the viewers, but did vindicate the channel's decision to show the programme itself. Not long afterwards, another Channel 4 era came to an end, as Jackson left for the United States. 
Meanwhile, Blair's relationship with the Americans was going to test the trust of the British people to breaking point. So honored the British Prime Minister has crossed an ocean to show his unity with America. Thank you for coming, friend. This mass terrorism is the new evil in our world today. I know that you would want to join with me in offering our deepest sympathy to the American people and our absolute shock and outrage at what has happened. After 9-11, people began to realize that the world beyond their noses actually mattered. And so did Channel 4. The channel is all about talking to people in the way in which they live, in the world in which they live, and about the bits of the world in which they don't live, but making it an accessible whole. Veiled women, hunched in the back of a pickup truck, a place of entertainment, turned into an execution ground. We're trying to uncover the truth beneath Afghanistan's veil of terror. Filmed before the invasion of Afghanistan, Beneath the Veil exposed the brutality of life under the Taliban. It was much admired, but not widely noticed. The Taliban have been in power in Afghanistan since 1996. Things have been getting progressively worse, and the world was not paying attention to what was going on in Afghanistan. Nobody seemed to care. Our first stop is the southern city of Kandahar. Then came the Everywhere war on terror, the and everyone wanted to see Cyrus' film, which was shown around the world. We live on an island, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't know about the rest of the world. Because if we don't know about them, we, we can't influence the world we live in. We can't help shape it. We can't help prevent another 9-11. Soon, Britain and America were embroiled in a war in Iraq that was as much about propaganda as weaponry. After liberation, the streets in Basra and Baghdad are sure to erupt in joy. Not for long. As the situation on the ground went from bad to worse, Channel 4 News and Current Affairs went to great lengths to tell the story from the front line. I'm waiting for a helicopter lift to take me into the heavily fortified green zone. That's where Saddam had his palaces and where the British and American embassies are presently located. His office is outside the green zone. It's a risk to get there. It's a risk I'm going to take because I think this is important. The invasion of Iraq is the greatest foreign policy disaster since Munich. And I thought both opportunistically but also in a sense of duty that we should be getting in there. You know, we should be getting in there because it ought to be. British television done properly, let's pile in. Everyone piled in, of course, and from all directions. But let's be clear, we're talking about a country where there's no opposition. As leader, he can ignore Parliament and... Sorry, that's Tony Blair, isn't it? Um... <laughs> anyway, so he doesn't even have to ask the country before he goes to war. Sorry, that's still Tony Blair. Um, <laughs> no, the difference is, Saddam rules Iraq through a combination of terror and brutality, backed up by a vicious regime of intimidation and torture. Or is that David Blunkett? <laughs> Iraq kind of lit a very, very dry, tinder-dry bonfire, and the whole lot went up, and we were going to just keep pushing and, and push them as hard as we can. Uh, good morning. Look, we believe Saddam has weapons of mass destruction. Now, if we don't attack him, then he might not use them, <laughs> in which case we'll never know whether he's got them or not. And, you know, that's not a risk I'm prepared to take. Jack Straw was, was saying to the Prime Minister that um, he was a bit worried about the way that Blair and Campbell have been portrayed in the programme. And I think, you know, if you've got a programme that's annoying Jack Straw, then uh, that's, that's good. <laughs> 